Hi folks, uh, Johnny Matthew here from johnnymatthew.com. I am a social worker and criminologist and I blog at johnnymatthew.com. Um, welcome to today's broadcast. Appreciate you uh, being here and tagging along. Um, the plan for today is just to review some of the issues that are current in the UK as far as social work practice and child protection uh, is concerned. Um, there are a number of reasons uh, f for concern and there's been some spotlight on this uh, in the press uh, recently. So I want to review some of those. Just to say, if you're new and uh, you've not seen me before on here, or indeed, if you're watching this on the replay, welcome and thanks for being here. Um, you can get this video and uh, I think I've only done one previous one that I've actually kept. Uh, and you can get those at johnnymatthew.com slash scopes. Um, I just wanted to make those available for people. Some people f prefer to listen and watch uh, rather than actually um, watching Periscope live or rather than um, reading the blog on the website. So there we go. So that's available. Uh, just to say, if you want to... Um, if you want to uh, chip in or ask any questions or comment, please do so um, and uh, via the comments section. If you'd like to share this post, just uh, swipe up if you're on Android or left to right if you're on uh, an iOS device and you can hit the share button there and your followers and social network will be able to uh, see the replay as well or join us now if they want. So um, also, just to say, if you'd like to offer some feedback and applause, share the love, as they say, if you just tap uh, in this bottom corner, if I can, if I can find it, about here, you should be able to, um, you should be able to give me some hearts, which I sort of think about as being a, a kind of friendly nod or a smile uh, from from an audience if if this were live. So thank you for that. I'm very grateful for any feedback, particularly for your comments or questions. So the Context for all this, I guess, is been the financial crisis that there has been in the Western world particularly, and we've all been affected to a greater or lesser degree um, by that, both personally and, of course, those of us involved in public service particularly, but also in manufacturing and other sectors, will have been affected, and uh, many people have suffered significantly in terms of loss of work uh, and so on with that. So that's the one contextual thing for all this. The second thing is that there's been something of a, tri a crisis in child protection uh, in the UK. Um, we've had uh, a number of significant events in, in, in previous years, as you will know. There's been Rotherham and stuff going on in Rochdale. Uh, there has been the recent uh, inception of the Goddard Historical Child Sexual Abuse Inquiry, uh, which will be a very significant piece of work over the next three or four years or so. Um, and all of that follows very quickly on the heels of the, um, the Savile scandal and the fallout from that and various other personalities and powerful people who have been uh, put in the frame and questioned about their uh, previous behaviour. So in a sense, certainly in the UK, we are re-examining and looking back and I suppose reappraising the way that we view our children uh, the way we view child protection and what kind of provisions we need in place in order to make that work effectively is clearly accepted as a principle that we need to be protecting children there needs to be services in place to help that where it's not happening naturally uh, but clearly uh, we're, we're revisiting that in light of past failures and quite monumental failures too so I guess what I'd like to do is draw those two things together the ideas of uh, financial austerity uh, necessary in terms of paying off financial debt uh, and uh, national debt um, and also the reappraisal of child protection and child protection practice uh, and how we should be responding to children at risk and I guess they come together in this basic idea that because the government necessarily is making cuts and being um, prudent in the management of the national finances uh, which is laudable and obviously a good thing uh, if we get where we want to go with that um, there are necessarily impacts from that which trickle down to local agencies because central government gives funds to local government. Local government then in turn is responsible for putting in place, amongst many other things, um, child protective services and child protection responses, 
when children are at risk. Now, because the government centrally is needing to tighten the purse strings and be more prudent uh, in what's happening with the, with the financial uh, pot that they've got available, that then means that there is a lesser pot available for local government. And uh, I guess what I'm saying is that from people who I talk to in the industry, in reading the industry press, and just the feel that one gets uh, in the ether of the profession is that there's quite a significant impact being felt on child protection. So I guess I want to just try and summarise uh, a few of those things for you. Um, I suppose the first, the, the main principal thing underlying all of this, the nub of it, if you like, is that there is a huge danger, and many would say it's already occurring, that in child protection practice, financial considerations outweigh considerations of risk to children. And if that's not happening, there's a danger that it will, or that the pressure that brings to bear is already starting to negatively influence practice. And certainly practitioners on the call face, I think, would echo that uh, quite clearly. So here we go. I want to look at five practice um, issues that seem to be arising and in many quarters have already arisen as a result of the convergence between um, financial austerity uh, and child protection. So the first one is that thresholds increase. So number one, thresholds increase. What this means is that the point at which a situation in a family is seen to merit a child protection response becomes more serious. So perhaps a case that yesterday or last year or five years ago would unquestionably have merited a child protection response may not do so today. The threshold at which we get involved has increased. And it may not do so today because of the resource implications of financial austerity, uh, lack of staff uh, and too many cases and all the rest of it. But when thresholds increase, the problem is that the danger that flows out from that is that some children remain at risk but are not attracting a child protection response. So it's a bit like... How sick do you have to be to merit calling an ambulance? And where there's lots of ambulances and lots of money, we may call one sooner and we may get a quicker response. But when we start to cut back on ambulances, we may think twice about calling one. And when we call one, it may not arrive quite so early. And that's a real issue for children at risk. So children remain in situations which previously may have merited a response that doesn't get a response now um, because... Um, because the threshold has increased. We no longer consider that kind of situation to be worthy, if you like, of a response. Or at least if we do, we feel unable to respond because of the lack of resources that are in play. And I think it's really important to say at the outset of all this that there is no criticism here for people working in child protection. Um, I've done it myself and been in that situation where uh, one is needed to respond to, to children at risk. It's a fantastic privilege and an immense challenge, that kind of work. Um, so this is not in any way intended as criticisms of, of my colleagues in child protection, far from it. But it is to say they're being placed in an extremely difficult position where they know that children are at risk, but because of the number of cases, the lack of resources, uh, that they are unable to respond in the way that perhaps they would like to because there are others that merit it more and we don't have the resources to cover them all. So that's a real, a real problem. And um, one, of the, one of the issues that comes up as a result of this as well is that people who may be less qualified to undertake some of this work are being asked to do it. There's been recent coverage in the press of student social workers, for instance, who routinely and under the code of practice uh, are not supposed to be held professionally responsible for leading on assessment and yet the word is trickling out from practice that that is occurring in some places and that's and that's a worry for two reasons one is that the experience isn't there to do a thorough job for the children and families concerned but also those guys are being put in very sensitive potentially personally and professionally risky situations uh, as a result okay if you've just joined us uh, welcome my name is Johnny Matthew. I'm a social worker, criminologist and blogger at johnnymatthew.com and this is my weekly broadcast where I'm summarising the blog post that went out last 
Sunday and the blog post was around austerity and its impact on child protection practice. So the, we've said the first thing is that thresholds increase. The second thing is that some cases end up being reclassified. So first one, thresholds increase. Secondly, some cases end up being reclassified. What do we mean by that? Well, social workers are sometimes, uh, and their managers, are encouraged to relook at cases um, which are open to them and to maybe downgrade the degree of concern uh, in order to either allow them to deal with the family on a different footing that doesn't require the same intensive input. That yeah, can be a resource-driven decision. Um, or because we've got too many other cases that are more serious that do require that level of input and we need to downgrade this one in order to allow us to work with the other one. And that's got all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, problems. Clearly, less money means fewer staff. Fewer staff means fewer investigations. Um, but the number of referrals coming in and the level of concern that is out there currently means that there's no drop-off in the amount of work that needs to be done. So we end up sifting those cases. And the danger is that some cases, similar to point one, thresholds increase, but in this case, what we're doing is we're effectively lowering the degree of concern that we say we have about a case in order that it drops outside of the category that needs an immediate response. And again, it's a resource-driven uh, thing. And regardless of how we classify cases, it still necessarily means that to a greater or lesser degree, there are still children in these situations who remain at risk. And clearly that's, that's, that's a problem. So thresholds increase. Cases can be reclassified and maybe, for instance, looked at as children in need instead of a child protection response. And one of the big problems with this dilemma is that we end up, and our third point is this, in false dichotomies to make decisions out of two possible choices when actually there should be more choices than that. So if we're if we're heightening thresholds and we're downgrading some cases, there will remain cases on the border of those categories that still require us to make decisions. And one of the problems with those is we can be forced into a false dichotomy that either, because we haven't got the time to work it and the resources to work it as we'd like, we get really involved and remove the children or over-respond in some similar way or we pull out and we either downgrade the case or we close the case. So instead of taking time to work with, walk alongside children, young people and their families to get a full and thorough idea of what's going on, instead of building relationships and building bridges of trust and rapport through which we can make really solid, well-scrutinized assessments and the decisions that flow from those, instead of all that, we end up having to move quickly, make decisions based on, well, we either get really involved, do something quite radical, remove the child, affect child protection proceedings, or we downgrade or we reclassify. And the dangers of those two decisions in the context of child protection uh, is really obvious and a real concern. And uh, it's something that uh, professionals are increasingly um, raising concerns about because money, resources, time, staff become the driver rather than risk and the need to invest time in relationships in order to give and find uh, a proper assessment of risk. And really it's only through proper thorough time taken assessment that we can make um, sound professional judgments about children's welfare. So that's our first three. Thresholds increase. Cases get reclassified, usually downgraded, and um, we can end up in a false dichotomy situation. One of the other things that's occurring, and our fourth point is this, that there is a brain drain of experienced staff in the child protection sector. So, if we think back to what we've just been talking about now, the Savile scandal and Rochdale and Rotherham, because of these things uh, and because of the fallout from that, uh, there have clearly been an impact in terms of pressure and expectation on child protection workers and the child protection system in general. And whilst there have re been really clear 
lessons that needed to be learned by agencies and individuals in this process. There is a fairly long-standing tradition in the UK of blaming frontline staff for these things. Now, if you want to go to the website, johnnymatthew.com, you can see the link on the screen behind me. Um, and there is, there is a blog post on there about child protection and safeguarding where I make an argument why the term safeguarding probably isn't the best one. And one of the reasons for that is that it can sound like it makes social workers and other child protection and social services staff responsible for child protection instead of being responsive to child protection concerns. My argument is the latter is the case and not the former. Um, but the problem is because of these issues and because of issues, particularly looking back to the baby P um, uh, situation that occurred and all the abject nonsense in the press around that which blames social workers without any foundation at all, um, clearly looking for a, a scapegoat. And because of that and other things that have happened since and because of the reflex in the press and the public to blame professionals, uh, people who've been around a long time, people who are worried about the workload, worried about some of these dilemmas that we've just been talking about, about thresholds increasing and downgrading cases, false dichotomies and so on. And because of the real pressure that without all these other things is always there in child protection, some of the more experienced staff are just deciding to leave. And if we think about um, early retirement and voluntary redundancy options which are quite often part of any package that um, seeks to save money then that again encourages some of these guys to go aside of any worries they may have about the uh, the integrity of their pension if they get blamed for something that comes up so we're placing these professionals in a really difficult situation whereby they're dealing with complex situations in child protection and one of the contexts for that is that there is a tendency at large to blame these guys when things go wrong. So when families, not social workers, when families do horrible things to children or, God forbid, a child dies, the social workers very often get blamed. So how can we possibly blame them for deciding, you know what, I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to pack it in early. I love this job, but I don't need this hassle. And so they leave. And one of the issues that comes from that, obviously, is that those who are newly qualified or less experienced coming into child protection settings don't benefit from the long-standing experience and knowledge uh, and uh, practice wisdom that these more uh, long-standing members of staff have. And that's a real problem. So managers who should be dealing more strategically with things end up getting involved in supervising cases very closely, maybe even micromanaging them. Members of staff who are not really that experienced just yet end up in supervisory roles or even in prematurely managerial roles uh, because they're forced to do so because somebody needs to manage the, the new staff and the newly qualified people who are coming in. So there's a real problem uh, with the brain drain and frankly in the time that we're in in this country post all these crises we can ill afford to lose the wealth of experience that uh, long-standing child protection professionals have and bring. And it's a real tragedy that uh, we're in a situation where that's happening. So thresholds increase, number one. Number two, cases get declassified. And number three, that those two things can lead us into false dichotomies, making decisions based on two um, rather stark polarized options. Number four, there is a brain drain. And lastly, I just want to raise this issue, which is perennial in social work as well as other agencies, of procedural obsession. Rightly so, when things go badly wrong and children get injured or they die, there is a serious case review and there are all kinds of other independent and management reviews and other investigations that take place. And quite often what comes from that is that there have been procedural issues that may uh, have contributed to the situation arising or more often I think we need to find a reason why it happened so we look for something in the system rather than looking at the fact that some people just treat their children extremely badly and no matter how diligent we are we can't do a lot about it. But one of the things that springs out from these responses and these investigations and so on is quite often a tightening and an expanding of procedural obligations. 
So frontline child protection staff are required to do more form filling, more accountability, more work on screen. And so what you tend to find is that the case manager, who's the senior member of staff in the case, who is usually the social worker or the most qualified member of staff, is also responsible for the procedure and therefore they spend more time doing that than they do in, or a disproportionate amount of their time doing that than they do um, executing the real work of child protection which is knocking on doors, speaking to families, liaising with schools, talking to employers, looking over case records, liaising with police colleagues, colleagues from education and so on. So instead of that rapport building, bridge building, information gathering, the more analytical investigatory work they end up ticking boxes on screens, filling forms in, ensuring appointments are properly recorded and so on. Now this is not to say that procedure isn't important, but it is to say that if we highlight and accentuate and expand procedure to the degree where it takes away from professional practice, we've undermined the very reason for doing that in the first place because we've taken people away from the real meat of the work and we're not helping ultimately the outcomes. So. One of the issues, again, is that if people are distracted from the real work of child protection, that, again, there is a risk that children remain at risk. There's a risk of heightened risk. So there we go. So those are the uh, five things I wanted to mention. Thresholds increase. Cases get declassified. There are false dichotomies that arise in decision-making. There is a brain drain of professional staff. And there is procedural uh, obsession or procedural distraction. So... Um, I, I hope that has been useful to you. Um, please give me some hearts if you're happy and you like it. I'd love it if you could share this uh, with your friends and your network. Um, you can swipe up if you're on Android and left to right if you're on iOS and just hit, scroll down, hit the share button. Um, I want to finish just by saying, I guess, all of these, this issue with austerity and child protection, it leaves us with a little bit of a wish list because... Here's what we want. What does the public want? Well, the public wants a system that responds to child protection concerns with professional, professionalism, with balance, and with rigor. A system that doesn't make mistakes and has the capacity to do a great job. And that's what people in the system want. So that's what the public want. What do professionals want? Well, those working in the field want to feel that they have the space and the time uh, the resources to do a proper job, to do the job they know they can do, to do the job that they were trained to do and that they know the public want, and above all, the job that children at risk need us to do. That's what professionals want. And what do policymakers want? Well, policymakers, they want a legacy of having dealt properly with child protection issues. Whomever the government of the day is, they don't want another Savile scandal, another Rotherham or another Rochdale to happen on their watch. So what they need is a system that works properly, a system that safeguards children, keeps an eye on them at school, in their clubs, extracurricular activities, but also a system that protects them when they're at risk that responds well. We're not responsible for child protection things, bad things happening to kids, but we are respons should be responsive to those issues. So the public wants a system that works, the professionals want to do a great job, and policymakers want to be seen and to actually do a diligent job over child protection issues. So I guess the question that I'm left with after all that is this, if those are the things we want, can we really put a price on child protection? I think the answer is no, we can't. And if there's an argument in one area of public life and public service for spending whatever is required to do the job properly, surely it is in protecting the vulnerable, downtrodden, damaged children who remain at risk in our society. So there we go. I hope that was helpful and useful and has helped to galvanise your thinking and maybe stir up some thoughts. Please um, share 
your hearts if you're watching this on the replay you can still give hearts by tapping in this what is it in this bottom corner here uh, if you want to watch again my first broadcast which is an introductory one you go to uh, johnnymatthew.com slash scopes um, if we are within the 24 hours of watching this broadcast then you can search uh, hashtag johnny scopes um, and and find it there so thank you um, I'd love you to visit the website. I've got a, an, a free ebook I would like to send you. It's called Connecting with Troubled Young People. Uh, and I'd like to give you that in exchange for an email address so that I can send you the blog post each week straight to your inbox. So my name's Johnny Matthew. I'm grateful for you being here. And I'll see you again soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.